Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to St. Thomas on the second Sunday. Let's see for that bit. Blessed be God who forgives all our sins. Bless you. Almighty God, to all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments and all the law in the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation, give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins, that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Seated.
thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slow. But it is patient with you, not wanting to perish. Well, not wanting any to perish, but all wanting to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and when the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of person ought you to be in leading life, holiness, and godliness, waiting for and hastening? of the day of God, because of which heaven will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the <coughs> elements will melt the fire. But in accordance with his promise, we we'll wait for new heaven and a new earth where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you're waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or flesh, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Mark. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out of the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thongs of his sandals. I have baptized you with water. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise the Lord. Lord.
Testament tells us a great deal about Mark. He was a son of a well-to-do woman in Jerusalem whose name was Mary, and whose home had been the meeting place of the early church. We learn this from the book of Acts. Mark was literally raised in the midst of the early Christian fellowship, so he knew well the leaders of the early New Testament church. Mark was the nephew of Barnabas, and when Paul took Barnabas with him on his first missionary journey, they took Mark along as a secretary and assistant. But that missionary journey became a rather unfortunate experience for Mark. You see, when they arrived in Asia Minor, in the coastal city of Perga, Paul wanted to travel on into the interior of the land, but for some reason, Mark left Paul and Barnabas there and returned home. We don't know why. There have been numerous suggestions offered as to why Mark might have left the journey. We, we know that the roads that they would travel were notorious for, for bandits and robbers. Maybe Mark was still young was simply afraid. Some have suggested that Mark may have felt that his uncle Barnabas should have been leading the missionary adventure rather than Paul, and that he left out of a sense of disapproval. At least one biblical scholar suggests something that makes sense. He said Mark was homesick. Mark left the company of Paul and his uncle Barnabas and returned home. We know that Paul and Barnabas continued on their journey, and when it came time to set off for a second missionary journey, Barnabas wanted to take Mark along, but Paul wouldn't have any part of it. And this caused a break between Paul and Barnabas, and to our knowledge, they never traveled again together. For a number of years, Mark vanishes from the scene. Tradition says that he went down to Egypt and founded a church there in Alexandria. What we do know is that when we hear from Mark again, we're surprised to learn that he's with, guess who? He's with Paul again. We learned that from Paul's letter to the Colossians, written while Paul was in prison in Rome. In another letter to Philemon, Paul mentions Mark as being a faithful servant. In one of Paul's last writings to Timothy, he again commends Mark for his faithful service. Paul had originally declared Mark a quitter and a disappointment, but whatever had happened in those years that followed, Mark redeemed himself and proved to be faithful to Paul in his ministry. But it's not from Paul that Mark received his knowledge and insight into the life of Jesus. That he received Peter, good old Peter. Mark may have met Peter again when he was in Rome with, with Paul, since both Paul and Peter spent their last days there and both died in Rome. However, we can be pretty sure that Mark had known Peter from the beginnings of the early New Testament church, since his home had been one of the regular meeting places those early Christians. Peter had been with Jesus, and he had a story to tell, and apparently he told it to Mark. It's obvious that Mark and Peter spent a good deal of time together, and Mark faithfully listened as Peter recalled the related words and events of Jesus' life. Mark's gospel is the nearest thing that we have to a first-hand biography of Jesus' life, and Mark paints a vivid picture of Jesus for us as we read his words. Mark's approach is simple and yet very dramatic. One of the things we've seen at the very beginning is that Mark never forgot the divine side of Jesus. We read just a moment ago the first verse of the first chapter of Mark's gospel, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark knew who Jesus was. He may not have known Jesus personally, but he knew without a doubt who Jesus was and he had a personal relationship with the Son of God heart. The other thing that we're going to see in the months to come as we read from Mark's gospel week after week is the humanity of Jesus. Mark, like none of the other writers, shows us Jesus in a very human way. Mark repeatedly finds just the right words to paint us a picture of Jesus that can't be forgotten. <coughs> Mark shows us Jesus' emotions. In chapter 7, Mark says that Jesus sighed deeply in spirit. Later, he said that Jesus was moved with compassion, that he marveled at their unbelief. Mark describes a time when, in his words, Jesus was compelled to righteous anger. It was only Mark who tells us that when Jesus looked at the rich young ruler, that he loved him. It was Mark who described Jesus feeling pangs of hunger, describing need for rest. Mark tells us to see the man more than any other writer. 
Another thing that we can see in Mark's gospel is his attention to detail. We can only imagine what it must have been like to sit and listen to Peter tell of the, the events of the daily life of Jesus to his disciples. Obviously, Peter had a vivid memory of the day-to-day -day activities and the, the little things that would have only been known by somebody who was there up close and personal, as the people like to say. But Matthew and Luke tell the story of Jesus taking, both of them tell the story of Jesus taking the little child and going into the middle of the group. But it's only Mark who says that Jesus held the child in his arms. All these synoptic writers tell the story of Jesus calming the stormy sea. But while Matthew and Luke simply say that Jesus got the boat and went to sleep, it's Mark who said that he got in the stern of the boat and fell asleep on a cushion. It's a little detail, but it helps to see Peter as he relived that amazing event and described it to Mark in every detail. Mark's gospel is not so much polished writing. Both Matthew and Luke are probably more refined in their reading. Maybe they might both have been better educated than either Mark or Peter. In the Greek, Mark does one of those things that Harold reminds me of so often in my own writings. In the third chapter, he runs 34 sentences together after one principal verb, but he just keeps track of it. say, and, 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 and he goes on and on. Now, fortunately, our English translators broke that up in our editions of the scriptures. Mark was almost childlike in his writings at times. He seemed to be so eager to get everything down, so why stop for a silly period? Just add, and, and, Start a new sentence. Mark also quite often uses the very aromatic words that Jesus used. When he does that, then he translates the words for his Gentile readers. In chapter 7, when Jesus heals the deaf mute, Mark writes, he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said, Epatha. And then Mark adds, which means be opened. In the 15th chapter, while Jesus is hanging in agony on the cross, Mark records some of Jesus' last words again in Aramaic. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, my who you forsake me. It's as though Peter were reliving that moment and he shared the story with Mark. And Mark was eager to retell the story for us in the very same way that he heard it from Peter. We talk a lot about Peter. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. But there's no doubt that Peter was a special man. Jesus challenged him to establish a new church after Jesus was gone, and Peter did. The story of Peter after Jesus' resurrection is found in the early chapters of the book of Acts. And it's a story of a man who knew Jesus in a very personal way and in a very meaningful way. Peter was able to preach with great power and conviction during the formative days of the early Christian church because of the relationship that he had with Jesus. And as we listen to the gospel readings each week here in the coming year, you might just want to close your eyes sometime, not, not go to sleep, but to attempt to just hear Peter telling his story about this man, Jesus. We began the second week of Advent season this morning, and I read the first eight verses of Mark's gospel to you. We know that the season of Advent is about the coming Advent's the four Sundays prior to Christmas when we think about the coming of the Christ child into the world. But just as we read in last week's lesson from the 13th chapter of Mark, we're still looking forward to a time when Jesus will come not as an infant born in an angel, but as the Son of God coming in his full glory. You recall that Jesus told his followers that no one knew when that day would come, not the angels in heaven, not even the Son of God. And then Jesus left these disciples with those words, be on guard, be alert, Advent, the coming. The biggest dissimilarity between Mark's gospel and the other two synoptic gospels is that Mark offers us no account of the Christmas story. There's no story of the visitation to Mary or Joseph by the angel. There's no account of the journey to Bethlehem to be taxed. Not even the story of the Magi. No flight to Egypt, no return to Nazareth. No visit to the temple, none of that. Mark's story begins when Peter's recollection of Jesus begins. And Mark makes no attempt to go back and fill in any of the blanks. Maybe that's why both Matthew and Luke provide us with this much details about Jesus' birth and early childhood as they do. Matthew tells us about the history before Jesus' birth. And Luke, the physician, describes Mary and the birth in great detail. Peter, or, or Mark, 
begins his account of Jesus by reminding us that the coming of Jesus had been foretold in the Old Testament by the Old Testament prophets. He recalls the word of the prophet Isaiah, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way. Those are the exact same words that were used by the prophet Malachi. They suggest the coming of John the Baptist, and they suggest a need for cleansing and purification, the very thing that John preached in his coming. John came, came saying, repent and be baptized. Baptism, even the time of Jesus, was recognized as a symbolic way of acknowledging one's need for cleansing. For the Gentile to convert to the Jewish faith, three things were required. First, he had to undergo circumcision. This was the mark of the covenant people that dated all the way back to the time of Abraham. The second thing that a person had to do was make a sacrifice. And this had to be a blood sacrifice because only blood could atone for sin. And the final thing that the convert was to do was to be baptized. And this symbolized the need to be cleansed from all their past life. And so it involved washing the whole body. Now the Jews who heard John the Baptist preach knew and understood what baptism was all about. What they didn't understand was why he was asking them to submit to the same ritual that prior to this only Gentiles needed to comply with. But what John was saying to the first century Jew was that in the, in the, in the racial sense, you're certainly Jewish. But they, that may not be the same thing as being a part of God's chosen people. Because things were about to change. John said, because of the one who's going to come after me, everyone needs to repent. And everyone needs to be baptized. Interestingly enough, when a person was baptized, he or she was also expected to make their confession. And what was that exactly about? What was expected of the new convert? It was a threefold confession. They were to confess to themselves. You first have to admit to yourself that, that you're a sinner and that you need to be forgiven. That's a, that's a good starting place. Then you're expected to make a confession to those whom you might have wronged. How can you go to God and ask about forgiveness when you haven't asked for forgiveness from someone who has offended you or forgiven someone that you may have offended? The final work, work and the step in the process was to make a confession to God. Have admitted to yourself that there are things in your life that shouldn't be there. Having attempted to make things right with those whom you may have hurt or harmed. Then we come before God with a prayer be merciful to me, a sinner. Now that may seem like a, a hard nut to swallow. But Mark tells us that people were coming out to hear the words of John and that they were being baptized by John in the Jordan River, both Gentile and Jew. What was it that made John's message so appealing? First, I believe that it's because they saw in John a man who was walking the walk, not just talking the talk. John was a man who had emerged in the desert with a powerful message. He had been in the desert with, with its solitude and desolation in order that he might be in a position to hear the voice of God. You know, we shouldn't attempt to share God's message if we first hadn't heard it ourselves. We can't say that, we can't share God's message until we've heard God's message. Preachers need to remember that. And John had done that during his time in the desert. I remember saying these words to a curate that was serving with me several years ago at St. James. I told him you can't share God's message with the people if you hadn't placed yourself in a position to hear God's message for yourself. I want him to understand that before he went to serve in his own church. Another thing that may have attracted the people was the way that John dressed. We're told that John wore garments of camel hair and a leather belt. That sounds a lot like the description of Elijah that's found in 2 Kings. John didn't have the appearance of one of the great orators today. He looked like one of the ancient prophets, and his words matched his appearance. John also had a simple diet. He ate like the poorest of the poor. Nothing that he did would detract from his message. John's message was effective because he told people what they needed to hear in their heart of hearts, because God had placed in John's heart a message that would reach the very depths of man's soul. His message was not just effective, it was irresistible because it was spoken by a man who had seemed to have the right and authority given by God to speak as he did. The Jewish voice of prophecy had been silent for 300 years. 
People were eager to hear some authentic word from God. And John did just that. His message was also effective because John was completely humble in his approach. He told the people that there was one who would come, and he wasn't even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. And finally, John's message was effective because he pointed to something and someone beyond himself. He told the people that he, he could wash them with water, but the one who was to come would wash them with the Holy Spirit. John said, my baptism will clean your, cleanse your body, but his baptism will cleanse your great soul. John preached and the people listened. Mark begins his story of Jesus' life, which he called the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. By introducing us to Jesus' cousin, John, who came out of the wilderness to prepare the way for the Messiah. And with that message, Mark begins to tell us Peter's story of the Messiah. And this morning's epistle lesson, we hear Peter say, The day of the Lord will come like a thief when we're least prepared. Peter was describing another advent, another coming, the second coming of Jesus that we talked about last week. I said a few weeks ago that when we heard a similar message from Paul, that I didn't spend a great deal of time thinking about the day of the Lord. But over the past year or so, I've certainly had the occasion to think about my own mortality. Back surgery, knee surgery, eye surgery, nose surgery. I, I think about the fragileness of each of our lives and the uncertainty tomorrow, about the fact that we will all one day meet our maker. And while that's not a fearful thought, it's certainly a sobering thought. So as we heard in the second week of Advent, the season that anticipates the coming of the Son of God, Messiah, the one who will save us on the day of the Lord, I challenge you not to put all those things in your life that need to be done. Let's not let ourselves get so wrapped up in so much of what the world thinks about the Christian season it's wonderful to decorate our trees and put up lights and buy gifts for our friends and family, but don't let that overshadow what Christmas and Advent season is really all about. Advent is about hearing and recognizing the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's about once again preparing ourselves for the coming of Jesus, not just as a babe and a manger, but as the Savior of the world who will come again in all his glory. May this Advent season be a joyful time for you as you look forward to celebrating the first coming of the Messiah. But may it also be a time of reflection and contemplation when we think of Jesus' second coming, holiness and godliness. And remember, God sent his son into the world. Why? Because God's good. Amen. Stand. Using the ancient words of the Nicene Creed, let us once again this morning confess our faith in God. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal God of the Father, God from God.
for this community, the nation, and the world. For God, our president, Greg, our governor, Nancy, our mayor, and for all of our allies of our country and for our enemies. For the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. Peace and unity of the Church of God. From Justin, Archbishop of Kennedy, Canterbury, from Michael, our presiding bishop, and George, our bishop, our own priests, and all bishops and other ministers. For all of you serve God in this church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation, we pray for those who are ill and those seeking the guidance and strength of the Holy Spirit. Matt, James, Elena, Doug, David, Carolyn, Thomas, Charles, Jim, Alan, Tracy, Kathy, Lewis, Alexei, Ann, Polly, Walter, Annette, Elena, John G., Barbara. We pray for those who are fighting cancer and long term illness. Jennifer, Jesse, Jesse, Nancy, Billy, Sally. Jim, Roger, Les, Carol, Monica, Mary, Paul, Andy, Bill, Luma, Beverly, Jarvis, Rick, Ricardo, Sandra, Victor, Susan, Joe, Laura, Jimmy, Ash, Jenny, Julia, Lynn, Ed, Karen, Van, Van, Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the lessons of this life. We exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died that they may have a place in your eternal life. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. We make the light of your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who have your repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Peace to you peace all. Peace to you all. Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink, drink it in remembrance of me.
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, Therefore is the kingdom of peace. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Mercy upon us. O Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. God that takes away the sins of the world. We do not presume to come to this thy table and mercy the Lord, trusting in our own righteousness and in our own great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to get up the crumbs of thy table, but thou art the same Lord whose property is always at mercy. Grant us therefore gracious Lord, so that we can bless thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and be raised in his blood, that we may ever more call him. Gifts of God for the people of God. Take them and remember to Christ God if you would eat on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you always. Amen. 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 Go in peace.